All right, everybody, welcome in to another episode live of Hockey Royalty, the official podcast for HockeyRoyalty.com. Today, we're going to be talking about news out of the desert in Vegas. We're going to be talking about the Tiny and Mervari signing, some trade rumors. Why don't you guys stay tuned to find out? I like that new intro from Russell. Quick and to the point, <laughs> you're here, Hockey Royalty Podcast, no BS. How's it going, fellas? Not bad, Brandon. Not bad, Brandon. How's the it's week going? going pretty good. good. <laughs> it's going good. It's going good. I, uh, I mean, another, I guess, news right now, right? I mean, the World Cup cities were announced. LA is getting uh, got a bid, so that's good for the people who live out there. A lot of North American cities, well, I guess it's all in North America, are getting uh, <laughs> getting some bids there. So hopefully, people who are soccer fans can go see some games. Uh, you're gonna be able to. You gonna Joe? You gonna make it up to Toronto to to take a look at some uh, games? I would love to. I'm a I'm a big soccer guy, so that would be awesome. I'm sure those tickets will be cheap in Toronto, no less. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Russell? Are you gonna try to make it up to SoFi and catch some soccer, or not? Not your thing, dude. No, I'd I'd love to. I'm I'm actually a big USA soccer. I'm not really. I guess one of those outlaws. I think is the group big following that they have. I'm not yeah. one of those, but. I do follow them. Hope they do well. They have a really good young team. I just watched them play against El Salvador. I think it was last night in the Nation and Concacaf Nations League. So, yeah, they have a really good young team. But um, people are excited around LA. But it'll be interesting with all the traffic. I'm sure that should be fun too. Yeah, they just they made it this year for Qatar, and then four more years for that young team to develop. They could be in their prime there, and it kind of makes some headways uh, for 2026. Obviously, the the group is getting bigger, so a lot more countries being there. It's going to be interesting. Uh, I saw this clip today that the U.S. last World Cup in the U.S. had the highest draw of any World Cup as far as total people who went to the games. And obviously, with more teams being introduced, more games being played, this one's just going to trump that. So it should be quite an event to see. Uh, but the biggest news out of hockey, uh, for at least for us Kings fans, is news from the desert here. So two things come out of Vegas uh, within a couple days. You have uh, them getting a new head coach, pretty lickety split with Bruce Cassidy at five years, four and a half million. And then uh, we think Ev Evgeny Dananoff got uh, traded for Shea Weber. <laughs> but as the Ux, uh, as the Ducks uh, trolled them on um, on Twitter, uh, they asked, are you sure? So um, uh, which is which is uh, par for the course there. What did you let's start with uh, the, the Dadanoff news here first. Let's start with the player. And, and well, actually, let's start with the coach. I think the coach maybe was the first signing. What do you guys think about Cassidy getting let go from the Bruins and then and signing there with Vegas pretty much within a couple of weeks? I mean, wasn't on the unemployment line for, for very long. Yeah, Cassidy just leaving Vegas, that whole situation was kind of strange. It kind of just came out of nowhere because, I mean, Boston hasn't been, I'm not sure, what, did they make it past the first round last year? I'm not sure what the playoff record is previous years, but... This past this year, they looked pretty good, but with a lot of the injury news that has come out, with I think it's McAvoy that's going to be out for a while, and they got a couple more other guys that are going to be injured for a bit. It'll be it's it's kind of weird, whatever that situation is up in Boston. So letting go of Cassidy made a, was a lot of question marks, I guess, that were raised when that happened. But I mean, for Vegas to scoop him right up, it seems like a pretty good get for them. Um, he's got a really good reputation with some of the players that he had up in Boston. Um, but and, and with the Eichel situation and everything that's gone on from from there in Vegas the last few years, it, it would be strange or it would be interesting to see if he's able to kind of solidify a spot in Vegas since they've had what this is now their third head coach in five years. So let's we'll see if he stays. I think it's a great move. Um, the problems in Boston were not had were not Cassidy. I mean that that they didn't do a good job on the management side. They really didn't replace David Krejci. Uh, they didn't have a second center. Eric Holla played well down the stretch, but they, they really didn't replace him. And I think this is a great hire. He's You look at what Boston has been able to do um, offensively, probably more importantly defensively, the way they do just don't allow chances. And I think you're going to see a much better defensive Vegas team next year. Um, Boston's power play was outstanding in recent years under Cassidy, and that could be something that, uh, you know, Vegas did not have a very good power play. And I think when you look at if they're healthy, you have Jack Eichel now and now Cassidy under the helm. I think it's a really good hire. Um, and I'm, you know, we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more um, with the that enough move. And I, I apologies to our guy, Richard Sarabia, but 
I'm very bullish on Vegas going into next year. I think that, um, and this is a good start for them. I think they got probably the best coach on the market. Um, and, you know, they freed up some cap space with, with that enough. So two good starts. Yeah. Joe Haggerty uh, on Twitter uh, at uh, Hags uh, with Hags uh, said, quote, uh, Cassie said, quote, you lick your wounds and console your children. And then the phone started ringing for me. Hockey wise, Vegas was a no brainer for me. I couldn't be more excited. And he said, quote, I got let go. This is not a revenge tour or something like that. I just want to prove myself that I can win in the postseason. You don't dwell on it every day, but it's in the back of your mind when you've been that close before. So it seems like he's coming in with a fresh mindset, a nice mindset. He's inheriting a good roster. Um, and it seems like, you know, he's got a good head on his shoulders coming into a new situation. Yeah, again, I think he's a great fit. Um, and I think if if they've really butchered some of those some of those issues um, it, it, with the draft a few years back, they had those three straight first round uh, picks in the first round that they really screwed up. Uh, they they've not done a great job of filling out the depth on that team. Uh, and again, they didn't replace Krejci. I, I think this is a really good hire um, for. Um, for Vegas, and I saw a move, one of the questions that came in, I do think it's better than getting Trots personally, um, because I think that Trots, Trots, I don't know, I, like he's obviously done really, really well with, with talented teams. Uh, he's won a cup, so I, I don't want to take anything away from him, but I just like what the way Cassidy worked the Bruins. I think he's he's a better, he can better well-rounded in terms of offensive and defensive side of the puck. So I, I'm a big, big fan of Cassidy's. Um, so I, in my opinion, yes, I do think it's better than trots. Carter agrees with you here. Dub move by the Bruins. Vegas will thrive if they stay healthy. Are you in agreement there, Russell, with with what Joe's putting down there as far as the the quality of the hire and and how this team looks going into next season? Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the open positions that were available around the NHL, Vegas had to be right at the top of the list. I mean. You go in there with that lineup already, and if they come back healthy, I mean, there's some cap gymnastics that need to happen. But, I mean, just look, they're already solidified down the middle with Eichel and, and then you have Carlson. I mean, they, that team is just stacked when they're healthy. So I, I'm sure whatever happened this past year is probably an anomaly for them going forward. As long as they can stay healthy, I think they're probably going to be favored to win the Pacific. Now, or here, Vegas still needs to fix in uh, in net, but they still should be good. Do you think Robin Leonard has what it takes to 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 take this team deep in the playoffs, or do you think they need to get a backup goalie like they did with with Flower? Obviously, he's not a he, oh, I guess he could still be available, but you know maybe like a Jack Campbell or something like that, a, a quality one B, or do you think that it's all Leonard all day? I think so. What we're going to see, and and I guess we can mix this in with the Dadanov trade, is that they just freed up some space there. I think what they may look to do is go cheap. And by cheap, I mean Logan Thompson. I think he played really well down the stretch for them when they needed him. He was good in the American Hockey League. I think that I wouldn't be surprised to see them try to shed uh, Laurent Brossois and, and maybe get rid of his. I think he makes two and a half and change or something like that. I don't know that they're going to be able to move Laner, and I don't know that they should. I think Laner is a good goaltender in the NHL. I think Logan Thompson showed that he can play, uh, and I think – It'll be. It won't be necessarily a one A one B. It would definitely be Laner, who's who's the starter. But I think a duo of Laner Thompson is perfectly fine. The issues with Vegas becomes their depth. And as Russ said, listen, if they're healthy, they're going to be dangerous. And I completely am on board with that. The issues that they've had is 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 their depth. You know, and that part of that is because some of the moves that they've made have been very aggressive. So they've traded pieces, they traded prospects, so they didn't have to those guys to backfill. So, you know, if somebody goes down, if Laner goes down, and now it's Logan Thompson, and you don't have anybody <laughs> coming up, I mean, it, it that's where it becomes a problem. Um, but the team's great. Um, so I, to answer your question, yeah, I think Laner and uh, a duo of Laner and Thompson is perfectly fine. Their, their philosophy kind of reminds me of a lot of another team in LA being the Rams where they pay a lot of top stars. You got Petrangelo Eichel, and then their depth is very, very soft, but you look at the Rams relied on all these big stars and Matt Stafford and Cooper cup and Aaron Donald, and they shined when they needed it the most. And so when you go this route and I, and I posted it in our group chat, no team has won a cup that is paying a player over 10 million. 
And like when you have so much money tied up in, in these big stars, you know, you have to, they have to produce series after series after series to get that cut because your depth isn't as good. And so that's uh, going to be, you know, more pressure on Eichel, more pressure on, on, on these other guys there and Petrangelo to, to get the job done. For sure. I mean, it, it's funny because you, you mentioned their goaltending situation right now and yeah, they have Leonard for, I think it's three more years at $5 million and, it's kind of an iffy situation with Leonard. He's had he's had some issues, I guess, with with I, I, he's had mental health problems. I hope everything's going good with him there. But um, it's it was kind of an interesting situation toward the end with the surgery, non surgery, yep. whole thing. So and then, like you mentioned, their backup is Brossois. But we're talking about Vegas here, and then they've been able to figure out ways to kind of manipulate the cap, and we saw that today with Dadenoff. I just envisioned them probably being a suitor for like a Billy Huso, just figuring out ways. Like we just talked about the Rams. Did you just, you look at that team and all the players that they've been able to sign. It's almost like how, where is this money coming from? And so when I think with Vegas, I think the same exact way, like where is all this money coming from? How were they able to give max contracts to Petrangelo and I inquire Eichel. And it's just like now that they've been able to shed around $5 million of the dad and off, they're still over the cap, I think, at this point. But if you look at trying to move a Leonard or a Riley Smith or any other player, I think you can still kind of make some make some uh, wiggle room there to bring in a, a top goaltender. Yeah, and I, and I want to say, and I think that you bring up a good point with the cap issues. I think the talk about their cap issues is a little overblown. Not to say they didn't have them, obviously. Not to say that they they didn't need to to make some moves to do it. But look what we just saw. We see this stuff happen in the NHL all the time. They bring on a dead mm-hmm. contract and tuck it in LTIR. Now I'll say, in bring, short- bring us into the next topic. There, we'll talk about the dead contract for, for everybody listening. So they traded Evgeny Dadanov to the Montreal Canadiens for Shea Weber, who Shea Weber is makes over seven million dollars, but he's going to be tucked on LTIR. I don't know if he's officially retired or how that has worked, but this has uh, pretty much got to be like, a, like a yeah, he's not going to play. He, he's not going to play. So two things on that. In the short term, it's a no-brainer. If you remember the deal they made in the in the deadline, they had to trade a second-round pick with Dadanov uh, to Anaheim. They just this was a straight swap. So the, the cap space is way more important to them. They didn't have to trade an asset. I will recommend SinbinVegas.com had a really nice breakdown of how this could really hurt Vegas in a couple of years. Um, but in the short term, it is a no-brainer. Um, and that's the way I look at it. Obviously, in the long term, their Vegas isn't concerned about the long term. Vegas is concerned about winning a cup in 22-23. So in that, in that aspect, it is a no-brainer. So they're going to be able to make moves like this. I mean, I'm perfectly – Alec Martinez is going to have a market. He's a left-shot D-man. He's a veteran. He makes – he's got one more year, I think, at $5 million, two more years. I think they're going to be able to move that contract, even if it is for – Again, it, it, it's poor asset management in terms of long term, but in the short term, they're going to be able to figure this out. I, I never thought this cap thing was going to be a big deal for them, that they would be able to figure it out. And this was one step in terms of doing that. Um, they're going to be really good if they're healthy next year, really good. So the Kings are going to have to deal with, you mentioned their strength on the middle, Jack Eichel, William Carlson, Chandler Stevenson had a great year last year. Nick Roy can Mm -hmm. play uh, center. I mean, this team is really good. So we'll see what else they do. I mean, listen, like you said, they're Vegas, and they're not afraid to make a big deal, and that may mean, I don't know, does William Carlson get traded and they make a shift, they shift some things around up front? Who knows? But I'm not concerned about their cap situation because i think they'll sort it out and we've seen in the nhl you can take on bad contracts and dead money to do that um so in the short term they're going to be perfectly fine in my opinion so we got a couple of mm-hmm. comments here uh richard coming in if the kings remain 90 to 100 percent healthy i can see them competing for the division uh with vegas i think a lot of us agree they're second overall i think they could compete this year if we get some some progress we'll talk about that more constantly during the off season there carter says he thinks vegas one kings two um, and then, uh, you look at, um, Carter says also if Weber retires, it'll screw over Nashville. I don't think he has the heart to do that. So I say he stays on that long-term IR. Um, let's get, let's move into the, the next topic, which is me talking about our great sponsors here at DraftKings. <laughs> uh, so the DraftKings here, 
Hockey fans, the pursuit of the Stanley Cup is on, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of, of the NHL, has an unbelievable offer for you in the most exciting playoff in sports. New customers can bet $5 on any team to win and get 100 in free bets no matter what, win or lose. Turn a small bet into a big payday during the playoffs. With DraftKings, same day game parlays, you can do just that. Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets, like which team will win, how many goals will be scored, and more. It is your shot at even a bigger payout. DraftKings is sp- uh, safe, secure, reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THPN. Bet $5 on any NHL team to win and get $100 in free bets no matter what. That's code THPN. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions may apply. See show notes for details. Speaking of the Stanley Cup playoffs, boys, abs up one nothing. Pretty crazy game in overtime. I know we don't want to get too deep into it, but uh, final starting off with a bang. It's a fun game, as expected, right? It's going to be a, it's a fun one. Those two teams, Colorado, are ridiculous. They're so fast. Let's get into more Kings news or a, some Kings news, uh, the start of Kings news, if you will. Uh, but before we do that, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, trying to boost. Everything up here at Hockey Royalty. But let's get into it. So Tynan signs uh, and then Morvari signs. Uh, we get the MVP back after his stint with Team USA over there in the World Championship. So, you know, the MVP getting some uh, getting some love there and getting on that roster. He signed a, a two-year deal, first being a two-way uh, contract. Second year is going to be a one-way. Uh, average AAV is going to be 787 and thousand and five hundred dollars and then Rivari comes in right afterwards and signs a deal i'm pulling it up here from our friends at cat friendly it's a two-year deal 762.50 or 500 uh for Rivari for a two-year deal less than what we had on our cap show right i thought we had a couple of nine nine hundred so rob Thanks, Lake bro. already outdoing us uh <laughs> saving some money right away uh and getting it going let's start with the tynan now the tynan move here for me there's there's is a little caveat because he still has to get snuck through waivers, right? So if a team wants that contract, they can. I know he made it through last year, but after back to back MVPs, maybe a team needs a four C and can take that contract before he sneak, sneaks through waivers. What do you guys think about that? Do you think he gets through and just the signing in general? Let's start with Joe on this one since you covered the rain with me, my man. Yeah, I, I imagine that that this is he'll be in Ontario to start the season. And um, as somebody who had a chance to to watch, you know, I watched pretty much, as you know, Rand in every rain game, and and we quickly came up with our our player of the week award. We basically just named it the TJ Tynan Award. He could have won it every week. I I don't know if I've seen a player dominate uh, a level of hockey the way he did all season. He was five of eighty four assists. He was five assists short of the AHL record. He was dominant, and he quarterbacked the uh, best power play in the history of the American Hockey League this year. It's It was a great re-sign because I think at the time when they got him last year, you know, he was the reigning MVP prior, like last summer too. They, so the Kings bring him in, and you figure they've got all these centers. They've got Byfield. They've got Turcotte. They've got Kapari. They've got Madden. They've got Anderson Dolan. Who's, why would they bring in another center who is obviously here to play first line center? He's the best player in the AHL. And I think it makes perfect sense because you, you give these other guys time to continue to marinate, continue to develop, move. Some guys were going to move to wing so you can let them sort that out. And also you're seeing a guy who is in his late twenties, he's 30 now, and you just see what it takes for to be a professional. And, and as good as he is, I almost think this is, this is, this isn't the reason that they brought him in, but like it, it can almost work out this way. You see how good TJ Tynan is in the American Hockey League, and he barely gets a sniff in in, in the NHL, which you know it it sucks for him because he's such a great player in the American Hockey League. But you know you can, it's, it's it's a sign to these young kids like you can be that good and that dominant and still have a hard time cracking it in the show. So um, I think he's a great. A, a great resign. I'm glad he's back. Um, and hopefully uh, for his sake and for the rain sake, they make a little bit of a deeper run, but heck of a signing, heck of a player. Yeah. This is only going to be great for the rain for the next two years. As far as him making it through waivers, I don't see it being an issue uh, this year. Uh, if he does get claimed on waivers, he would have to play at least 
I believe, 10 games in the NHL. So if a team maybe wants to see him as a look and maybe for the future, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the thing with us. It's, it's, it's weird because you see these players that excel so well in the AHL, but just for some reason aren't able to put it together in the NHL, which is, I mean, it just happens. And it's not the worst thing to have that happen to this player. I mean, you can have these type of great AHL players help out these young players that we see playing on the rain right now. I mean, to have that development, to have that piece play alongside players like Fagimo, Madden, Akil Thomas. I mean, look at, like, you get a two-time AHL MVP playing with these players, showing them how to play in the minors. I mean, I think that's just a great signing by Rob Blake to keep uh, Tynan around, and and I don't see it being a problem with him making it through the waivers and sticking with the rain this season. Um, Next season, we'll see what happens, because it'll be one year left on his deal, and people might be more inclined to um, give him an NHL chance. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I like it. I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, or maybe not a lot, but some people are like, oh, well, the rain had their chance, you know, Byfield is in, in the pros and, you know, and everything like that. But you still got, you still got guys that, that are second round picks, like for Francisco Pinelli, you're going to have Martin Kromiak. Yep. Yep. You're going to have a lot of these guys here and there aren't a lot of spots available on the Kings. And so, you know, you're looking at like, they could be a Calder candidate, for the next, you know, three, four years with how many prospects we have and to have a veteran like that, that can come in and be a two-time MVP gives you the best shot there because we all know goaltending was their weakest point. And then injuries, obviously, because the constant pull up and pull down of of the NHL squad and then the injuries throughout the rain. And so you look at it, if they're healthy, you know, and, and the Kings are healthy, that team probably goes way farther than they did this season. Um, I mean, they got absolutely ransacked by Colorado, but if you, I mean, I think it's a great signing and let me go to you, Joe, on this. I mean, it really wasn't in our notes. If they don't sign Ferk, which was his line mate all year, Ward ended up with him towards the end of the year, which, which score do you really think that is, you think Chromiak will get a look because his speed yeah. matches with Tynan? Do yeah. you think Fagimo gets to the NHL level or do you think he sits on the first line with his 30 plus? I think you're going to see either Fagimo or Chromiak on the right side. And that's why, so in the, in the, we did the predictions in terms of what, what free agents were going to be back. What's what guys that we didn't think were going to be back. And I thought Tynan would be back because I think the Kings value what he brings to the team, both on and off the ice. I didn't think FERC would because I think two, for two reasons. One, I think there's going to be an NHL opportunity for Martin FERC somewhere Two, Samuel Fagimo and Martin Chromiak. Um, are going to be, unless something happens and Figimo either gets traded or some, if he actually cracks the Kings roster, but as you just said, there's not a lot of room. And I'd, I would be surprised if Figimo cracks the roster uh, in Los Angeles a little bit. Um, so you have Figimo who scored L-W-1. 27, to, to, to Figimo scored 27 goals last year. Chromiak lit up Kingston, and I think he is going to be a really exciting player. And to put him next to Tynan would be a – just a perfect fit. So I think that's part of the reason why I don't know if, if we'll see FERC back. And and yeah, so I think the answer is going to be either Fagimo or Chromiak or maybe both at certain points. Taylor Ward did get a lot of action up there. And I think he he, he did a pretty good job playing the left and the right side for the rain. Um, don't know that I see him getting a, a, a full-time look with Tynan, but maybe, you know, uh, they, they played well together. So perhaps, but I think the, the score on that line with Tynan is going to be Fagimo or, or Chromiak, one of the two. Yeah, I really think I think Chromiak sits well. I mean, obviously, Fagimo has that one-timer as well. But Chromiak, all his highlights from from Kingston were just light and, you know, piss missiles from the dot over there. And I don't think they're going to miss – I mean, not to say you won't miss a beat without the 109-mile-per-hour right. shot. But Chromiak is the guy that, that loves to shoot the one-timer. And you're going to see a lot of dishes from Tynan to Chromiak in the, on the power play next season, and it's going to be a fun to watch. Yep. Let, let's yeah, keep... we, we, we actually we talk a lot about Brent Clark and, and seeing if he's going to have a chance to crack the NHL lineup. I think I think we need to all be paying attention to Martin Chromiak because yep. he looked really good last year during the rookie camp, and I think there was a chance for him to make the NHL roster, but with all the crowd that was going on, it didn't really come to fruition for. So look, look for this year. I wouldn't be surprised, Russ. And, and this is, man, this is no slight at Fagimo because he had such a good season in, in Ontario. I, I, there's a shot. I think there's a better shot. Chromiak could crack the lineup in LA this year than Fagimo. That might be a little bit of a hot take, but um, Chromiak, I'm really excited about. 
Yeah, so let's get into our second one here. Mervari signs, like I get it, two years, a little over uh, 760. Uh, Joe, did you need 36 minutes for, for your take on this, or uh, were you able to tone it down? Uh, I mean, everybody knows how much that's paid attention or, or followed me or listened to us. I mean, I love Jacob Mervari. Um, I think he's the perfect guy to have. He's going to fill out a bottom pair. I think he could fit in in the bottom pair in Los Angeles, depending on what they do, depending on if they bring somebody in, if they don't, or whoever it might be, he, he's perfect. He, he's Carter, a, Carter scores agrees with you there. So yes. Yeah. Carter scores. He, he knows, he knows he's followed me on Twitter. He knows uh, <laughs> how happy I am. Like, and he's a perfect compliment too to a guy like whether it's a Sean Dursey or, or, you know, whoever, like one of these offensive defensemen that they have, he's such a steady stay at home, but he's such got such a good stick. His gap controls. Great. Makes a great first pass. Like he's in, I, I equate him to have said this before, and it may be lazy, but he's almost like a – I could see him being a left-handed, left-side Matt Roy, just really quiet, steady Eddie, not going to wow you, but because he's got such a good first pass, like you might be surprised to see that he picks up a bundle of assists throughout the season just because he's got that good you know, good first pass in transition. So I'm really excited about the Mulverari signing. I think that – he probably ends up being their seventh defenseman. I have to think the Kings address the left side of the D this off season, which I think would inevitably push him to the seventh defenseman, but um, maybe not. I guess we'll see. I don't know what you think about where he slots in, but I thought he had a decent showing. Again, he only had a couple of assists. He's not a guy that's going to pick up points, but I think that um, he he's somebody that, that I think could slot in nicely um, on the third pair for L.A. Yeah, R- Russell, where do you see him fitting in? I mean, obviously, Joe said they, they need to make a move. I mean, Chikrin's the leading one. If they don't make a move, either free agency or via trade, are you comfortable with Mervari as the the third D-man on the left side? Yeah, I, I, I am. I thought he looked really good in his 19 NHL games to, to the point where I thought he might be an option um, for game one against the Oilers if Mikey Anderson wasn't available. And so the thing with Moviari is he's not the flashiest player, but he does, when you watch him play, he makes so many simple moves and plays that just make the game run so much smoother for the de- defense. And, and those type of smooth transitional moves and passes, those little short passes, those, that's clutch to have on the back end. And for, for Jacob Moviari, you look at what his contract is right now, that's going to be a really solid, inexpensive piece to have as like your sixth say, even seventh defensive some defenseman going into next season. I mean, if you look at how we talked about this on the salary cap show, if you look at how the, the salary situation looks or the depth chart looks for the Kings right now, I wouldn't be surprised if they just kind of stand pat and just roll with the seven defensemen that they have right now with Anderson, Dowdy, um, Bjornfoot, Roy, Clark, Dursey, and then, or I'm sorry, Walker, Dersey, and then you mm-hmm. have Moviari. So, I mean, depending on what happens with Brant Clark, him now going to a summer camp with um, Team Canada. We'll see what happens with the World Juniors in August. Maybe he or he's not even a chance for his team in training camp. But I, I, I think Brian Clark, like, like I wrote in my last article, I think Brian Clark is the best, biggest wild card yeah. in all the players on the Kings because with the way that the defensive roster kind of looks right now, if he's able to come into training camp, NHL camp, and show that he's ready to make the NHL roster right now, I think that puts a lot of other players in flux and maybe make, forces Rob Blake to make a move. Yeah, and I I, I don't want to overreact to 19 NHL games that Moverari had, but just watching him as long as I did in Ontario and then the 19 games, he looked that same style, that same steady Eddie type of play. I I'd rather see him on the roster and in a spot than and and Bjornfoot down in Ontario, frankly. And I and I've yeah. kind of been harsh on Bjornfoot here. I think on uh, amongst the hockey royalty guys, I I just I'm struggling here with him. Like I, I know there's flashes, I know there's a talented player in there, but we haven't seen it really. I mean, if we're being honest, I just don't think we've seen it. Maybe a game here or there, we've seen some flashes, but he hasn't looked like a steady defensive defenseman like we see from Overari. And with the exception of a couple of rushes here and there, I, I don't know that we've seen this this offensive talent from Bjornford either. So I'm not sure what he is. 
uh, right now. And, and I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if he's in Ontario next season and just maybe give him a chance to kind of reset things. He's still very, very young. Don't don't forget. But and I'm not necessarily giving up on him, but I haven't seen a whole lot to get excited about in the first hundred games. So I, I got no problem if Bjornfoot, you know, spends some time in Ontario next year. Yeah, and yeah, the, we, the thing we, the thing with Bjornfoot is that like if you look at all the Kings defensemen right now, they all you can all you can kind of define what their role is. Like Drew Doughty is obviously Drew Doughty, he's like this all around top player. But look at all the young players: Sean Dersey, a lot of offensive capabilities. Jordan yeah. Spence, a lot of offensive capabilities. Oviari, Mikey Anderson, kind of like those shut down kind of stay at home yep. defensemen. Tobias Bjornfoot, we don't really know what type of role or what type of defenseman he is. Is he going to be that puck-moving type, skated through the neutral zone defenseman? We've seen that at times. Is he going to be that shutdown defenseman? We've seen that at times too. I mean, there's yeah. yeah, if he can develop into that player where he can kind of be good on both sides, but I think he's kind of teeter, teetering on like a point where he doesn't really know what his role as an NHL defenseman is yet. With Moviari, that's why I see like, you know what you're going to get out of Jacob yep. Moviari. You're going to get solid 15, 18 minutes a game playing some good defensive hockey. So if you pair him with a player like Jordan Spence, Sean Dersey, I think that pair can work. We saw what happened when they tried to pair Tobias Bjornfoot with Sean Dersey. It didn't work because those both those players, Bjornfoot wasn't able to kind of mesh with Dersey and Dersey's offensive capabilities. So yeah. I think with Moviari, I think that's kind of his, his, him being able to define what type of player he is gives him a better chance at making the NHL roster going into next season. Yeah, I mean, you need – it's a perfect pair because Jersey's a riverboat gambler. He's going to make mm-hmm. mistakes, but you you live and die with that because you know what he can bring offensively. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I And, again, I don't want to give up on Bjorn Fit necessarily, but I, I think he just needs an extended run. And, listen, he was thrust into the NHL at a pretty young age, right? He's been playing mm-hmm. – with the Kings here for a few seasons. And he, he was a teenager, if I'm not mistaken, that he was with the, with LA. So yep. like it's, it's, it's going to take some time not to say he's done or he's not going to develop into a good defenseman so far though. I just haven't seen it, you know, and with the amount of defensemen that they have, I don't know where he fits. I mean, men still develop, you know, size and everything like that until they're, you know, 21 to 24, depending on the, on the person. I mean, he's still growing. He's still becoming, and I think he got shoved in and you look at, what he was doing for the world junior team in Sweden. He was a captain there. He was very much a stalwart. He was penalty killer one. And like, you see all the, that against his own age group. And like you said, being thrust into the NHL out of necessity for the lineup that the Kings had at the moment, and maybe was rushed his development process. And it's going to be a little bit later. We have some agreement here from some of the fans here. Um, you know, more voice, solid, good, cheap signing. Uh, we have Carter score says, I don't recall Mavari ever making a bad pass in a short stint. Tape to tape is huge and forwards. Love One that. Yep. Mavari mm-hmm. for Bjornfoot on the third pair is a great idea. Sorry, Joe, I know you were going to rebuttal what I said or, or comment on it. What, what, uh, you can go ahead. No, no, the, what I was going to say too was the other, the, 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 there's a big difference here. Like Mavari, where he played in Sweden, he came over in, into Ontario. The, uh, the 2020-2021 season, he is going to be turning 24 in August. Bjornfoot just turned 21. Mm-hmm. Like he, that's a big – there's three years difference between these guys too. Like I don't want to – there's there's a reason that Moverari has kind of settled into what he is. He's steady Eddie, and he's he knows exactly what he's doing when he's on the ice. He's, he's been doing this now professionally for a few years where Bjornfoot was kind of thrown in to the fire a bit as a, at a young age at the top level, it's, it's, you know, it is different. And again, I, I don't mean to be harsh on Bjorn foot. It's just right now we haven't seen it if we're being fair. So um, what he is, is still a question. we got a fan question here that kind of leads into our next topic. So th- this might be a good segue. Hopefully uh, comes in what he said, question for Joe, but I think uh, both he'll be fine if all of us answer uh, looking at the, at what the market will be this summer for left wing players. Would you rather play Mervoire and focus on getting a left wing one, or would you rather continue the hunt for Chikrin? So I've gone back and forth on this, um, but my I think my opinion is the Kings. I still think are their their strength and depth is up front. You know, we've talked about Figimo, we've talked about Chromiak. 
Akil Thomas had a huge end to last season. Don't forget about him. Anderson Dolan had a great season. Um, Tyler Madden had a okay season, battled with injury. Um, pretty sure there's a guy named Turcotte, his first name Alex, uh, that's still in Ontario that that we'll see what can can come of him. So I still think the strength of this team, I haven't even mentioned Gabe Velarde, Rasmus Kapari, guys I'm big fans of too. So long-winded way of saying, to me, LD2 is a huge hole, a huge hole. This team is not advancing in postseason with the current – and I love Moverari. I don't know that Moverari is an NHL LD2. Bjornfoot's not an NHL LD2. Who's playing LD2? Is it Sean Walker? Because we, if we talk about maybe moving him to the left side, is that a big ask for him? That's a big hole for me. So, yes, I would rather go get Chikrin – and roll the dice that we have the depth at forwards, or maybe sign a depth piece, <clears throat> Mason Marchment, um, for a <laughs> type of thing, rather than go for a big, big forward. If I had to pick, I'm going to – LD2 is a big hole. It's a big hole that, in my opinion, needs to get filled. Russell, would you agree, or, or you want to rebuttal here? No, I'm, I absolutely agree. I think the Kings should go all in on, on Chikrin. I mean, you just named – Joe, you just named, like, six or seven players that we that are high-end blue chip prospects that would probably be in the top five of any other NHL team's prospect list uh, on in, at forward. I mean, so there aren't that many holes really at forward either. You The top six is almost pretty much solidified with maybe, say, a wing position to play with Kopitar. You right. already have the, the mad line with uh, more Arvidsson and Deneau. Byfield and Kaliev are around. Grunstrom looks really good. And then Lazat. Um, then you, you have all those players to fill those young holes, those fourth line holes. So if you look at the left side of the defense right now, there's, there's nothing that really pops out at you. There's, there's Mike Anderson, Jacob Moviari, Tobias Bjornfoot. It's pretty much it in the depth, in the prospect pipeline, it's Kim Nosyainen and Kirill, Kirill Kursanov. There's not that Brant Clark on the left side or that right. high end blue chip prospect on the left side with all these forward prospects that the Kings have. Shed some of them, bring in Chikorin, and now you have a really solid top four that you can build off of with Anderson, Dowdy, Chikorin, Roy. I mean, you have Brant Clark, Sean Dursey just waiting in the wings. That that defensive lineup is looks solid on paper, and if you can get those two to kind of mesh together, I think you're looking at a really good um, playoff type roster going into next year. Because let's face it, the biggest, the most glaring hole for the Kings was offensive production from the defense. Yep. And now that if you're able to bring in Chikrin, who led the NHL in scoring as a defenseman just two years ago, I think that's a real solid ask at a really cheap price at only like $4 million a year for that's three years. Thing. Which And yeah, and, and exactly. And that's the big caveat here that we're not even talking about is you talk about all these teams that are just really up against the cap right now that are just trying to look at – look at what Vegas just did. They just traded a player for nothing just to get rid of $5 million in cap space. If you're able to bring in a player like Jacob Chikrin at like half of what he's probably worth right now in the NHL, you do that all day. And if if it costs four first round pick kind of pieces, the Kings have that and more. That would make, that would probably barely make a dent in their prospect pool. So make the move, solidify your top four and then move on. That's what I say. And I would say this too, you know, if, if the idea is, wow, you know, Fagimo isn't, isn't, ready or he's not good enough or Chromiak's not going to be good enough or Kaliev isn't good enough. Well, then you screwed up. The, <laughs> the, the development hasn't been good enough then, right? If we're, let's honestly, like mm-hmm. you just said, these are, these are top end prospects that will probably be hot, the top prospects in any organization, right? And if the Kings, for whatever reason, whether it's maybe they're just hesitant to give those young guys that first line minutes, which I can appreciate, but at some point, you got to find out what these guys have. And I think they did Mm -hmm. a really good job with Kaliev last year. And they proved a lot of people wrong, me included. Like you can't bring up Kaliev and just have him play in the fourth line. He's going to be, it's not going to do him any good. Well, that's wrong. It did him a heck of a lot of good because he he really learned how to play a solid two way game. So you got to find out here. Can Kaliev play first line? Can Figimo get, get minutes up there? You know, I'm sorry. Like, I think that you can, you can, you got to find out what these guys have. And if they don't work, well, then, you know, maybe something went wrong somewhere. But you look at a lot of these prospects now, and at some point, this maybe is a little different conversation, but 
I'm still very high on Byfield. I said before, come holiday next year, he's going to be great. Kaliev looked really good. Rasmus Kapari, Samuel Fagimo, Chromiak, Tyler Madden. I mean, I mean, Madden was acquired via trade, but Akil Thomas. If, if Hellenius if, looked at it at World Juniors, Francisco Pinelli had a, a Alex Turcotte. Year. If these guys all miss, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I'm 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 not saying I'm worried about that, right? Like, I, I'm very confident that, that they're going to hit on a few of these guys. So don't get me wrong. But like, if you're so concerned that because Kapari's not good enough, Kaliev's not good enough, um, Fagimo's not good enough. He just scored 27 goals in the HL last year. Well, then there's a problem here. I, I don't know. Like that's that's where I'm at with this. I think it's time to to let it run. You've got to you, and go at it from a depth scoring approach. You've got Kopitar and Kempe to anchor that first line. You need to address the lefty. You talked about the Mad line; they were great last year. Byfield is on your third line. Lazat solidifies the fourth line. Like I, I think they can just come at it from a depth standpoint. Maybe add a a, a depth piece at a good price, but. Chikrin, the D, the left D for me is is a is a bigger concern. I think that leads us into the the trade rumor section here, uh, and this is time to put on our tinfoil hats and 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 or GM hats, if you will. Uh, but we got a couple of fan thing. Uh, we got a, uh, I think Caleb and Byfield are going to take a big step next year. Hopefully, Kapari too, or Velarde if he stays. Kirsanov is Mikey Anderson 2.0. We'll see you with the comparison. Russian. We'll see what the Russian factor does recently if, if things uh, cool up over there and if he'd be able to come over to, to the States. Uh, Chikorin and Roy would be a tough pair for teams to deal with on both ends. Yep. We have a question here before we get into the two guys we're talking about, which is going to be Debrinket and Pasternak. Uh, but Don Juan here comes. Do you guys think Brock Faber will be used as one of the trade chips to acquire Chikorin? And I, I think anybody is on the table outside of Byfield, I would say Kaliev and and um, and Brent Clark at this point. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, I've said it for a while now, and I think I catch a lot of heat that you know that I want to trade Brock Faber. I don't want to trade Brock Faber. When you look at the amount of depth that they have on the right side, I actually think he could be the one that has the most value. Not named Clark. I think who who has more value in the trade market? Jersey Spence or Faber? I'd argue it's Faber. Um, you know, maybe teams are really interested in Jersey after the season he had um, and sh- what he showed. Same with Spence, but I- I'd argue that it may be Brock Faber. So if that is the case and he maybe has the highest perceived value, you cash in on that. And that's not to say he's not a bad player. Like he's, I'm sure he's going to be a really good NHL defenseman, but you also still have Jersey, Spence, Clark, Wagner, Roy, <laughs> like Helgi Grunz. Like they're all mm-hmm. Helgi Grunz. Good God. How did I forget him? Like they're all still there. So you can't keep all these guys. Like I said, don't hug your prospects. Yeah, Brock Vapor is probably going to be a really good defenseman. But at some point, you're going to have to make a decision on some of these guys. Um, and when you, and of all those guys, Helgi Grunz is the one that I would not trade. I would try not to trade, of course, is what I mean. I mean, obviously, it is what it is. But Helgi Grunz, I, I would have had of slightly Jersey, Spence, and Faber for me. And that's who am I? But that's my opinion. We had uh, we had two uh, draft episodes. If you guys didn't see those, one was Scott Wheeler and Corey Proman, both at the Athletic. And Wheeler said that Slavkovsky, you know, has been rising up a lot of people's boards, you know, to maybe one or two, because of the fact that he played against men. He played in the Olympics and was an MVP. He played in the World Championships. You see, Faber's played at every single level in in mm-hmm. pro hockey before becoming a pro. And that could that could pique some people's interest to where he could go straight from the NCAA after Minnesota tries to win uh, <clears throat> a championship and go straight into a team come come April or May for the playoffs and maybe they don't even bat an eye, and so that could be a, a trade chip that they they possibly could be looking at there. Uh, let's get into the first one here. Armand brought it up, so we'll start with the Pasternak rumors of Pasternak. Uh, you know that possibility being traded. I think the coach leaving there, it wasn't official uh, as far as from the team or anything like that, but multiple reporters or a reporter said that it's a possibility. And then uh, L.A. fans went wild, me included, uh, about the possibility of of eating pasta every night while watching the Kings play. Uh, Let's start with Russell on this. What did you think about the the rumor itself? Uh, And then what would bringing Pasternak to L.A. mean for this team come next season? 
Probably not the best to start with me because I'm probably the biggest Debbie Downer on this whole situation. I'm okay, Joe. A, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not the biggest fan of bringing Pasternak to LA, and then and I'll explain. It's I know what Pasternak is. He's obviously a perennial forty goal scorer in the NHL every season. Yeah, I get that. The thing, the thing with Pasternak is if you bring him in, you look at the cap situation right now for the Kings. They're pretty much against it right now. So yeah. there's still probably some wiggle room to bring in a couple pieces here and there, small to medium to short um, kind of term deals. If you bring in Pasternak, that's it. That's your franchise going forward. You're looking at all the young pieces that you have now, and you're building around Pasternak and whatever else is left. Because Pasternak right now, yeah, next season he's going to have $6.6 million cap, cap hit. After that, you're probably looking at close to 8.5, maybe even $9 million a year. And we kind of did a little cap manipulation on that last salary cap pod where just looking forward next year and the next few years, the Kings are still kind of up against it until maybe even Andre Quick or Andre Kobitar goes goes uh, away or maybe gets a new deal. With Jonathan Quick's deal coming off after next year, there's still there's a little bit more of space to, to deal with. But with Pasternak, Man, that's that's going to eat up a lot of that, a big chunk, and it's probably going to be him and Drew Doughty that are going to be the highest uh, contracts on the Kings um, for the term. So, yeah, bringing him in would be would be great, but you have to think of the price that's going to cost, which is a, a heavy price, even though he's only got one year left. It's going to be still an expensive piece to bring in or expensive cost, and then you also got to consider the cap that he's going to have to have going forward if he wants to re-sign. So. Any move that he does that that gets made, if the Kings do make that move, will have to be contingent on him signing an extension as well. Because we don't want another Milan Lucic situation where he just comes and he gets brought over for one, one one year and then leaves. So, if the Kings do end up making that move, just make sure you have that extension in place. And remember, he you, he also has to decide to to list the Kings on his uh, on his no trade clause because he's got a modified no trade clause. So there, there's that to consider as well. All right, Joe, uh, come up with some positivity here, man. I know I just <laughs> said that LD2 is my number one and the Kings need to focus on the, the back end first. So let's pretend they don't, right? Let's say that this is they're going to stick with, as Russ said, it wouldn't be that shocking if they kind of stick with the crop that they have. Then I am all in on David Bastronak. Um <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Russ is right. Like <laughs> it, it could become a cap issue, but I think what I what I like about it, and especially if you can get him without trading Brant Clark, I wrote the piece that said it could cost a first Brant Clark, Alex Turcott, and maybe a fourth piece. Like it could be a heavy, heavy price to pay. And I'm operating under the assumption that the Kings would have a deal in place to lock him up long term, which is why I would be mm -hmm. willing to do that. Um, so Pasternak, though checks every box for me elite on the power play elite goal scorer elite finisher something the kings have needed forever and what i kind of like about it is is that first year you it's almost like it buys them a year to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of it because he's in at six six and change it becomes an issue the following year when you have to pay him more money whatever that extension is nine nine i, I think i used the nine and a half in my article for comparison's sake so but quicks money coming off the books trevor moore was no longer here maybe you then do entertain Dion enough you you entertain sure you entertain trading you know maybe then and alex i follow but the reason i didn't get too into it is like that's a year out right now and i, I mm -hmm. the way i look at it not to say you don't want to focus on things if you're a management of how are we going to address this in a year obviously that's what they should be doing but I think that there are ways that they can do it with some money coming off the books to where this first year at six and change, they can find a way to get him in. And then I don't think it would be that difficult to say he signs nine, nine and a half million dollars. I don't think it would be that hard to maneuver some, some cap around to get him in. So I love David Pasternak. He is my favorite of any even potentially available forward. Um, I like him better than Forsberg. I like him better than Debrinket. I like him better than Fiala. Um, I I am I, all in on Pasternak. Now, again, I th I do think the Kings' biggest need is that lefty. 
if they decide to go for the forward route and they go for a big forward splash, it's Pasternak for me. I, I agree with you there. I think he's my favorite out of the forward splashes. And I, I think the thing that I was talking about on, on the Discord was, uh, with a couple fans is the fact that, like, you know, you look at the the Rangers, and even though they didn't go far this year, they went out and got, you know, they went out and got Panarin because those types of players don't come available often. That's like, the there's, a, there's a chance that none of our prospects ever reach that level. And a good so, chance. And there's a, uh, it's a great chance. It's probably over 95% chance. And so – you know, you're looking at will any prospect ever be a perennial multi-year 40 goal scorer? Probably not. And this guy is this guy's young. You can give him an eight-year deal, and he'd still be 34, right? No, 26, uh, eight year, yeah, 32. So you know, um, no, 34. I was right the first you're time. Right. Yes. Uh, and to where at the tail end of his career, nine and a half million at, at that eight years from now doesn't look like it. Probably doesn't look like much with the ESPN money. I mean, you, we just spent 20 minutes on why the Vegas cap issues ain't a big deal. Like, if I think Rob Blake would figure it out. And mm-hmm. then for me, that's my thing. It's like, I, I agree with you both that LD2 is more important for the Kings to progress next year. I think they would still progress with Pasternak. But you can find LD2s in the league. You, It's hard to acquire a 40-goal scorer. You, that's why Vetchkin stayed with his team for so long. P- players don't like that, don't come on the market very often. And who's to say that any prospect that we have ever reaches that potential? And so I, I, I just, I'm a fan of it and go for it. I mean, we just talked about the Rams going out and getting the best corner in the game because, you know, they don't have a first round pick for eight years, but they're getting players that are proven in the league. And because the fact that prospects are a crapshoot, they really yeah. are. Yeah, and and um, I, like I know people crap on Vegas for the, how aggressive they get, but you know what? They're they're going for it, and in some mm-hmm. ways, you you kind of appreciate that. And um, I don't, know, I, I I definitely am am in on pasta, and that's why I was so in on Jack Eichel too. Like these guys don't become available that often. And listen, obviously, this past or next stuff is total speculation. He may be nowhere near available, but like you, if he were. You just don't see guys like that become available too often. So when one is, man, you better put your best foot forward and at least make an effort to get them. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But uh, if another team beats you, whatever. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think that there, I think there's a way to get around, and especially if you could pull it off without giving up Brant Clark. Mm-hmm. I, and even Sign more. me up every way. You'd probably have to include Aya Follow in the deal to kind of move some money out, which could could free up a little bit more space. Um, yeah, Boston might be more willing to take on Aya Follow. He seems Aya Follow in Boston kind of makes makes a lot of sense. He he feels like a prototypical Bruins player. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, the thing with the Pasternak, yeah, it's you bring him in that that's going to be your piece. And and could the Kings win a Stanley Cup with maybe building around Pasternak players like Byfield, Kalia, Clark? Could see it probably happening. I mean, you get if those players can live up to their potential, that's a pretty solid core to build around. I'm kind of coming around to the idea as my mind as my mind thinks, but yeah, yeah. it's it's just it's a big move, and it's it something is. that the Kings just haven't really. It doesn't Pasternak on the Kings just it doesn't feel right to me. It just it doesn't. Yeah. I don't know. It's just he doesn't feel like that kind of prototypical Kings player where they kind of just make that move for that perennial score, which we of course we've lamented that they need obviously. So bring him in, yeah, it would help. But there is, there has been some questions about his defensive play, some of that. So that's kind of why I, I, I think about maybe Rob Blake kind of looks at him, would look at him um, and kind of say, okay, maybe I'll just kind of back away a little bit because the cost is going to be high not only to acquire him, but then to pay him in the future as well. Let me ask you this, Russ. We've, we've kind of talked about, you know, waiting, like the, what's next for this Kings. Of, it, we always try to compare back to 10 years ago mm-hmm. and – that Mike Richards, Jeff Carter move. Would this not be the Jeff Carter move? Jeff Carter was a proto. He was a goal scorer. That was what he did was score goals. Like, is that, that's sort of what this, I know it's not exactly the same, but he, I think he was signed to a really long deal, but it was a pretty good number. Even at the mm-hmm. time, I think it was a good number mm-hmm. uh, years ago. But like, I look at it similar in that way that you're, you're trading. That's your Jeff Carter. That's your, I think at the time Carter was a no. Nah, Carter scored forty, didn't he? He was a forty. He was. I'm, I'm trying to bring up his stats right now, but he was. Yeah, he was having pretty good years. I mean, you think about his years in Philly. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure he was a forty goal. Yeah, he was forty six goals in 2008, yeah. 2009. 
yeah, so I mean, this, this, I, I kind of look at it sort of like that. And again, it's, I know it's not totally apples to apples, but you know, we've been waiting for the Kings and, and is Blake going to pull off that, that kind of Mike Richards, Jeff Carter deal. I think pasta could sort of fit that or, or the guy we'll talk about next in to bring it too, who's obviously a, a goal scoring threat. Yeah. I think yeah. actually the biggest comparison, not, not to compare the players, but to compare the kind of situation is when they tra- is when the Bruins traded Joe, Joe Thornton to the Sharks. I mean, Joe, Joe Thornton was 26 years old. And yep. the biggest talk was about that time was who won that trade. I know there was like a lot of players involved. I believe even Marco, Marco Sturm was one of the players. What? Sturm, Primo. I think there's a bunch of names involved. And the biggest talk was like, okay, who, who won that trade? And I've always said that whoever gets the best player wins the trade. So, oh, there's yeah, a shark gonna, that trade with a no brainer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you're paying a lot to get Pasternak, you're going to win the trade because he's obviously going to be the best tra- player involved in the deal. So we'll see what happens. Carter Scores comes in here with a quick thought before we get to Debrinket. Pierre-Luc Dubois is the dark horse candidate for me. People keep talking about his character issues, but he's been killing it since getting away from trots. Do you see him maybe as a casualty up uh, up north? You know, it's funny. We talked about the Winnipeg in our cap show, right, Russ? Mm-hmm. I don't think we yeah. mentioned Dubois. Like, I'm pigeonholed um, that I always view it like he's a center, and that's where I keep him. But he can play the left side. He can play the wing. Now, I don't know if he wants to play the wing, if he would be interested in that. I love Pierre-Luc Dubois. And if he was a casualty in Winnipeg and we could get our hands on Pierre-Luc Dubois, love it. I'm all in on him too. Um, But, again, I don't know where he fits. If if he's a center – He's not a media center in Los Angeles. Is he okay playing left wing? I don't know. But I very much like Dubois. I think it's an interesting shout. I think there's a lot of interesting guys on that Winnipeg team that mm-hmm. what's going to happen, but we don't know what they're going to do, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, actually, Winnipeg is probably one of the bigger names to watch when it comes to the offseason because I don't know if it was Shifley or Wheeler, but one of them kind of mentioned, like, they don't really know what's kind of going on with the franchise going forward. There's a, a lot of question marks. Yeah. PLD is going to need a new deal. You have a lot of great talent, a lot of top end talent there with with Shifley, Wheeler, Connor, Ehlers, who is a great player. Um, so I don't know if they maybe move some pieces. If they do end up moving pieces, that's not going to make a lot of players happy up there who are looking no. to win now. So I, I would envision that team to maybe make moves going forward to win. But if management isn't on board, if ownership's not on board, then you're going to see a lot of players wanting out of Winnipeg. I got to think they they got Connor Hellebuck still. Like you got to try to still take some kicks at the can when when you've mm-hmm. still got that top end talent. Connor Ehlers, Dubois, Hellebuck. Like I got to think there's ways that you can address that roster to be more competitive in the short term. Yeah, and they, they have go. some good young talent. Perfetti is going to be a great player. They have some good defensive talent. I'm trying to Philly Hanola. He's a great young defenseman. So. There's a lot of good young talent there. I think there just needs to be a little bit more patience in Winnipeg because if PLD can develop, he's only 23 years old. And we saw what happened with Tortorella. I think there was one game, I think the one game where Tortorella actually yelled at him and then he went out and scored a hat trick. <laughs> so there's there's been a lot of ups and downs with PLD in terms of being traded from Columbus to Winnipeg now. But I think if, he, if they kind of give it a little more patience, he can develop into a good player and you match him alongside a player like Cole Perfetti, I think – there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, good young talent coming up in Winnipeg, and they can make some noise going into next season. Yeah, good shout out, Perfetti. Yeah, let's uh, let's go to the next guy we're talking about, uh, the cat, Debrinket, right here uh, from uh, Michigan in the United States. Uh, 5'7", 165, smaller guy, but he knows how to put it in the, in the net, 24 years old. Has one year left on his uh, deal here at 6.4 uh, mil. Uh, another great score. You have 28 his uh, his rookie year, 41, 18, 32, and 41. So, what do we think about him? And 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 where does do you see him as a, a step down from a, a Pasternak? Do you see it as maybe the ask would be less, the the extension would be less? Like, how do you feel about this? Maybe we'll start with Russell again on this one. Yeah, I think we have to look at to bring it as a step down from Pasternak. Pasternak's. I mean, he's got a lot of. He's got some good size. He's he's kind of look a little bit more like a complete player with with to bring it. I hate to bring up his size, but it, you have to because five seven one sixty, you're going to have a hard time kind of playing in the corners, and especially for a team like the Kings, 
who love to play the, that kind of gritty game, but have kind of moved, I guess, now to a, a more transitional type game. Does pass? Does to bring it kind of fit that role? You you can't really just look at just his scoring because the Kings the Kings have really kind of looked more for those all around type players that can play that puck retrieval type role and then also skate uh, speed type factor to it as well. But you, you see what they brought with uh, Trevor Moore, Philip Deneau, Victor Arvidsson. So to bring in another player who's kind of like smaller on the on the smaller end. Yeah, I don't know. I think you just need to look at the Kings looking for more size up front and maybe just kind of wait for those um, those prospects to develop before bringing in um, a piece like Dabrinkit. As much as as much as I love Dabrinkit as a player, I think he's a great player. I just don't see the Kings being a fit for him as a trade. Yeah, I um, it's not a totally different situation than um, – I mean, he's a little younger, so the RFA situation's a bit um, – He's in, so he's going to be an R. He's still an RFA where where Post is going to be UFA. So that's the biggest difference. But you got a, a, mm -hmm. a young goal scorer who needs a new contract, right? And you figure if the team signs him or trades for him, they're probably going to sign him and lock him up because it's going to take a bundle to get him. I prefer Pasta, but that doesn't mean that it, I don't mean that to be any sort of negative on on the brink. The kid can score. Um, and again, you, when you're talking about what what LA needs on the wing and the top six and on that power play, it's guys that can finish, and he is a pure finisher. So you see the fit in terms of that. My preference is Pasta. I like. I I, I think he's he's a. I just like the player better, but that's not a knock on the brinket. I imagine again, it's probably going to be costly. You got a guy that you've got under team control for a couple of years as an RFA. Again, you're probably mm -hmm. locking him up to an extension. Again, are you, you know, you're probably looking at, at trading a key piece, you know, maybe it's Brant Clark, you know, a first round pick, a Brant Clark. I, I it could be a, a, a really, really big deal, especially if the Blackhawks are going to blow it up. You know, they're probably looking for a really, really young player like a, like a Clark, you know, who still could be a couple years away from being an impact and give them a couple, um, you know, a, a couple more years to buy some time. So I like the player. He certainly fill, uh, fits a need. Um, we'll see if the King, you know, and, and Russ talked about it, like the Kings and Blake has not been a GM yet. That's made a big splash. He's gone under the radar and he'd been really solid in these moves. He's, he's, just knocked it out of the park in a lot of trades. So this is a big off season for him as to where he strikes. And if he makes a splash up front to break, it would be that. Yeah. yeah I, I think, think go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah. I think it's just something like, you know, it's a, it's in a, we're in a weird position to where, and I think it's advantageous for the Kings that the trade doesn't need to happen. I think a lot of fans are looking at it, Okay, we brought in Arvidsson and Deneau. We made this huge leap to 99 points. Next year's got to be, a, you know, 110 points. And we need to make this big splash this year. But that's not necessarily the case, especially since sure. what we talked about from the forward, forward standpoint. Like, we have a lot of guys that can step up, right? I mean, we're, we're going to get into later in the summer, you know, past uh, – past performance, future expectations. And and Joe's a big Byfield fan come December. You know, does he plot in 15 to 20 goals? And do you get extra scoring from other parts of, of the roster to where if the offer isn't right, do you really go out and go get that? You know, to where LD2, we like you said, we have two guys in our in our pool that are can fill up that spot. And one of our first round pick isn't playing up to expectation. So, you know, there's less of a chance for us to go out and uh or grow that from within you know like i think they're in an advantageous position to to make the right move whenever they see fit and i think king's fans want the big move i would like the big move if if pasta was an la king i'd be thrilled about it but <laughs> right. but it's not a necessity to make that move sure where mm -hmm. i think last summer was i think like going into the season with velarde as your second center like was scary like or relying on byfield to do that and sure. and have a reliable jump you know, if we didn't get to know and Byfield hurts his ankle again, like that team is super thin and we're not even close to making the playoffs. We're probably a lottery team again. So I, I, I think this year, some fans, me included, need to maybe pump the brakes on this high power trade. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, there's no need for Blake to like force force it is what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> I think for me, for me, it just comes down to the, you know, I don't know. At some point, there has to be a, a, a breaking point of you've got all these prospects 
are they just going to sit in Ontario for their careers? And that's, that's what it is. That's what, what, that's where Figuimo is going to be. That's where they're going to play. Or are we going to use these assets? Cause these assets can be used to play or they can be used as trade pieces. And I just feel at some point there's gotta be something that gives, maybe not to your point. It doesn't have to happen. I mean, they can certainly roll into next season, be more cautious and kind of take that route and say, Hey, if we get some, uh, you know, Drew Doughty will be healthy. And uh, there's logic there. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I think if you, if you want to try to um, take that next step, you probably have to try to bring in an impact player somewhere, whether it's on LD two or whether it's, um, you know, up front. Yeah, the thing, the biggest question going into next season is going to be, and what I'm going to ask is, what's the expectation this year? Because we talked all about about how maybe the Kings kind of surpassed expectations. Yeah, some people maybe within the franchise and the organization pick were kind of had a goal to make the playoffs, and a lot of people outside the organization around the league didn't really see that happening. But now that they did make that jump, what's next? Are you are you just going to just keep striving to be that kind of low end playoff type team where you make playoffs, but you don't really make a lot of noise or you're trying to make some, make the next step where you win a couple series maybe and even go a little bit further. But the thing when right now we have to look at is the Kings have so many, have still a lot of young talent that still needs to be developed. And I think the reason that people look at these trades that could come, that could possibly happen is the Kings probably have the most amount of trade capital out of any team in the NHL. You look at their salary cap situation, you look at the amount of prospects they have, they still have pretty much all their draft picks. So, I mean, they could pretty much make any deal. And the reason why I'm a little more, I guess, shy on bringing in Debrinkit is you just paid a lot, of, a lot of money to bring in and a lot of prospects to bring in a player like Debrinkit, who's probably going to be around $7.5 million a year going to his next deal. Why didn't you just sign Philip Forsberg for eight point five million dollars, and you you could have had him for for nothing? He's probably even a better player than Debrinket. So that's where that's where I'm like, is if you're going to make that big move, go big or go home. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm like talking myself into the Pasternak, but it's like you if the Kings welcome are still, to the dark side. Yeah, we're, exactly. <laughs> the Kings are. We've talked about this multiple times. It's like the Kings are still they still haven't made that big Mike Richards type trade. So for it to happen, the Kings just have to pull, pull the plug and just go all in on a certain player. So if you're going to make a trade for where you're trading for like a Debrinket, just go all out and trade for a Pasternak if he's available or sign a player like Philip Forsberg. And I think part of it is people may, in, in the organization too, rightfully so, maybe want to be cautious about rushing things or rushing the the, the process mm-hmm. here and, and trading all these assets for for one big piece. But th- th- what I kind of alluded to earlier with the Kings, if you trade a few assets, say take any three assets plus a first round pick. So say it's four assets, okay? You are still, like we aren't even talking about, Chromiak hasn't played. I know he had a cup of coffee in the HL before, but Chromiak hasn't even played in the AHL. Fagimo just scored 27 goals in the AHL. Francisco Pinelli is, is had a coming off a good season in Kitchener, so we'll see what he does um, in his second year in the OHL. Like, there's at some point you, you either trust you, there's got to be some sort of trust level in your in your development that you know what we're going to make this big splash, we're going to trade some assets to do it, but we trust the guys that we've picked to backfill these guys that that we. We, we made the right calls. Like, this is going to be okay. Like we're not selling the farm. We're trading a lot of assets because we have them, but we are still well cropped. Right. So I, I think, so I think they have the ability to do that again. It's way easier for us to say, and I appreciate that. And I respect where, you know, Blake and management are coming from with that. So we'll see what happens, but let's, let's call a spade a spade. There are two glaring holes. They need a goal scorer and a finisher and they need LD two how they address those this off season or, and, and going forward. That's what we'll see. Joe, you make a good point because the athletic came out with an article that the Kings were top three in the league in developing homegrown players. As far as the players that they drafted, how many games they played in the NHL, whether it was for them or for somebody else or developing it amongst them and, and the quality of each, like where they've drafted it and overproduction from that draft pick. We the only, the only thing that they haven't really had is, that super elite Star. player, uh, you know, recently, obviously they had Dowdy and, and Kopitar, yep. but you know, as far as, as far as that goes, that's where they've really been missing. And if they can't, 
if they can't develop it or not saying they can't, but if you do go trade for one, then your goal is accomplished regardless of whether you grew it or you paid for it. You know, you're, you're still getting that production. Russell, be, uh, go ahead and, 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 and you were about to say something before I cut in. No. Yeah. It, it's, I'll just go back to what I think the expectations are for this year. As much as I want to see the Kings and Rob Blake trade for a piece like Chikrin, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if they give it just one more year just to see what kind of what they have from some of these young prospects. Sure. We sure. haven't seen Fagimo. I mean, we've seen him get in the NHL, yeah. kind of get a taste with all the injuries happened, but we still don't know what we have out of Alex Turcotte. Gabe Velarde needs to get a full year in the NHL. And you, you have to kind of see what you have out of these pieces. But then I also go back to like, okay, well, you don't you want to sell your assets th- when they're at their highest value. So I mean, right now you look at all these young young assets and the young players that the Kings have in terms of trade assets, their their value might not be higher than it is right now. So maybe That's you make that move point. right now, or is, or you maybe wait to see if maybe these players can develop, and now you have just a plethora. What, I mean, what if all these players develop into really good young, uh, NHL sure. talent? Then you have almost like a dynasty that you're building where the Kings just Kings fans just need to be a little bit more patient because in three or four years, you can have a real powerhouse type team with the amount of prospects that the Kings have. Like if you play a hypothetical, I think you make a great point about trade when to trade your the prospects. Like la- a year ago, you would be laughed out of town if to trade Gabe Velarde and Alex Turcott plus for Jack Eichel. Mm-hmm. What trade value does Gabe Velarde and Alex Turcott have right now? Yeah, like, like if you play a hypothetical of, you know, there was rumors that the Arizona liked Velarde. If they do say it's Velarde, Bjornfoot, Turcotte, and a first, are Kings struggling for prospects still by trading those guys? You still have Clark, right? Chromiak, Vagimo. We just we can sit here and rattle them all off. So again, I, I. Totally acknowledge this is not fantasy sports. This isn't a video game, and we're sitting this, and we're just kind of spitting off our hips here. But like, that's a reasonable, I think, trade offer. Maybe it's heavy. From I'm sure Kings fans will say, "What are you crazy? You're going to give up that much?" I, you know, people thought I was nuts for giving up Brant Clark for Pasternak. Like, so that happens. But like, I, I think the Kings are in a spot where they have such a loaded pool that they can they can make this trade and still have a loaded pool. So mm-hmm. it is, it's a, it's a delicate balance and it's, it's, it's really, again, that's why Blake gets paid the big bucks and it's not us. Yeah, um, you know, for sure. so it, I have, it's a tough call. I have a fan question after this. Carter uh, agrees with both Russell and I, I think the fans are expecting to go from 99 to an elite team in just one year. Mm-hmm. And that's not realistic after one season. He says, uh, I think one or two, just breaking the, the truck, the, the, the one or two barrier is a realistic expectation. I have this comment up here that I think is kind of interesting, um, and I don't want to butcher the name, so I'm just going to read the comment here. I, I think we need a play driver rather than a finisher. Debrinket had Kane passing him the puck. Pasternak had Marshawn and Bergeron. Kings have none that can pass the puck. So I look at it this way. Kopitar is an excellent passer. But, you know, Kempe is not really a top-line passer. He's a finisher. You know, we don't really have that finesse play driver that is just an assist machine. Do you think that that's where the Kings need to go, being that they do have Kaliev and Kempe is coming into his own as a shooter, uh, a play driver, a playmaker, a, a visionary on the power play instead of a, a sniper? So this is why I think they need Jacob Chikrin. This is why I think it needs to come from the back end because they do have play drivers. Phil Deneau is a play driver. Maybe mm-hmm. he's not a pure playmaker, but he's a play driver. When you look at as the the numbers he puts up and the possession statistics he puts up, the expected goals that he puts up year over year at five on five, he is a play driver. But we saw his deficiencies as a power play player, right? He's, he's not that just naturally gifted, talented player, but he drives play at five on five. Andre Kopitar is, is obviously – all that and then some, and he's also a, a fantastic playmaker. So I do think they, and I think Quinton Byfield, that's the goal, right? That he's going to evolve into that play driving centerman. So I think they have play drivers. Um, and I can see the the point, I guess, about playmakers and passers. Like Kopitar is a great, is an elite passer. Um, and I think Rasmus Kapari is actually a pretty sneaky passer uh, as well. But obviously his role is kind of a bottom six right now. So 
I can sort of see where that's coming from. And Phil Deneau, who, while I say he's a play driver, I wouldn't necessarily consider him an elite playmaker. So that's fair. But I think you have a, you're not moving. You're generally your playmakers are your centers. You don't generally, you don't usually see high level playmakers from the wing. Obviously, Patrick Kane is, is a bit of a, 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 you know, is an example of a winger who's just an elite passer as well. But I think this is where the Kings can can offset this by having it come from the back end. And Russ, you said before that the offense from the from the back end was just non-existent last year, in part because of Dowdy and Walker's injuries. But fact is, it just didn't happen last year on the back end. So you have play drivers up front, and you you got your 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 spine. You have your Kopitar, Dano, if Byfield, and and even Lazad. Again, that line controlled possession. They're driving play. Now, there's the, you know, they chipped in offensively maybe more than people would have expected them to. You get a puck moving defenseman, a defenseman that can jump into the play a little bit more, a healthy Drew Doughty that can they can contribute on the power play. You start to incorporate some of these young players and creative players, your Velardis, your your Kaparis, um, Kaliebs, and incorporate them onto the power play a little bit more rather than your Ayafalo and Dano's, I think that's where you can see some success. And you talk about a playmaker. Gabe Velarde is that. Gabe, mm-hmm. Gabe Velarde could be as good a playmaker on the Kings. Now, again, we don't need to go. I know this has been beaten to death. I love him. I understand that McClellan didn't necessarily trust him. There's deficiencies at 5-on-5. Five five. I, I get it. But from a pure playmaker, he is exactly that. But I think because of what they have locked in down the middle, um, they're really only looking for one winger, you could say, in the top six, I guess, right? So I think what they need is that that playmaker from the back end. I think it's got to come from the blue line because I think they're set in play drivers from up the middle. I don't know what you think, Russ. No, yeah, I, I totally agree. The The playmaking ability needs to be brought up from, from the defensive side. I mean, you didn't even mention Arthur Kaliev, who's who's turned out to be one of – almost a better passer than he is a shooter. And I don't even know how that's possible because, I mean, a lot of the passes that he's made this past season were, were really great. I mean, I forget which goal he had, but he, he had some real lasers, like surface-to-surface surface missiles that were just going across the ice. So I really like his passing ability. So for the Kings to look for more of a playmaking type player to bring in, I just, I just don't see that happening. They just need a, They just need more scorers, more players that are able to and I think it just has to be with players that are able to clean up maybe the loose rebounds in front of the net because it seemed like a lot of the times the Kings were missing that kind of net front cap- like net front presence. We look, I mean, look what Dustin Brown was able to do just two years ago. He led the Kings in goals, and most of his goals were like five feet away from the crease because they were all coming from the power play, just knocking in loose pucks. So they haven't really had that after Dustin Brown had um, kind of a down year last year and his last year in the NHL. Now – they're kind of missing that net front presence. So look for that to be more of a primary. Um, Jared Anderson. One. Yeah. I mean, Jared oh, sorry, Anderson I was, I was, I had something right here. I'm sorry. Hey, yeah. I mean, and look, what, look what Anderson Dolan was able to do on the power play. No one really envisioned, envisioned him as a power play type player in the AHL, oh, but so yeah. And now that we're, we're seeing him clean up those garbage goals for the rain. I think that's, that's a player you have to watch. And, and really a, the type of player that the Kings are going to need. Um, going into the next next season, and I, you know, not that, and I don't want, not, I don't mean to any any you know disrespect to the person that asked the question because I know there's people that that always say this too, and not not even just the one person that asked, like you know, wow, to bring mm-hmm. in Patrick Kane or Pasternak had this, you know, Bergeron, Kempe had Kopitar. Like Kempe just scored three. Are we not giving credit to Andre Kopitar as as the elite passer? He just he just was a hand in hand had a career year with with you know gave it to Adrian Kempe. So like I, I don't know. I I think Andre Kopitar and that's the winger we're probably looking to fill is an elite passer still. He's still one of the better playmakers in the game. Um, for I think he still got a couple of years left at that at that level. So I think it's a it's an interesting thought, and I don't I don't hate. I think it's an interesting question um, and a good way to look at it, but. The way I approach it is it needs to come from the back end because I do think they have play drivers. I think there's enough creativity up front. I just think, um, you know, there, there's some tweaks that can be made. But um, interesting thought. Yeah, I would say probably their three best young playmakers are still 22 years of old and young, younger. You look at Velarde, By, Byfield, and Kaliev. They're all still re- really young players who are just barely getting their feet wet in the NHL. Uh, like we'll probably talk about yeah. this on another pod, but this is going to be a big year 
for those three players specifically in terms of their development and how they kind of fit into the franchise's um, goals, long-term future. Yeah. So, well, it, it's been a good one, guys. We're right at the, the hour 15 mark. Again, you can find all of the articles. We're pumping them out daily. Draft stock, player profiles at HockeyRoyalty.com. Uh, Russell's working on some new merch, uh, so keep an eye out that for coming up soon. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Hockey underscore Royalty. You can find me at Randall Commando 24 or Joe at JW Paterino, and Russell at, at NHL Russell. We have a lot of stuff coming in here for you guys. We're going to be uh, doing a little bit of crossovers, hopefully, with a Coyotes podcast to talk more trade talk. We're going to hopefully get some more interviews with some with some uh, draft content and and talk about our roster and how we think they're going to fare come up next season. we got a lot of good stuff coming up for you guys uh, this summer, so keep an eye out. Uh, anything to add there, fellas? Oh, yeah. The draft is what? What? 20 days? Less than 20 days away now? I mean, dude, this offseason, it's almost here. I mean, we saw we saw what the trade today, it almost got my blood pumping because I'm like, man, you remember last year the Kings made that Arbison trade, I think, after game two of the Stanley Cup final. So, I mean, with Moviari being signed, I mean, just Moviari and Tynion now being signed, signings are happening. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to wake up tomorrow morning and see the Kings just make that big trade or makes any type of move. So the offseason is pretty much upon us now. So look for – keep the phones ready. Be yeah, on, be on always lookout. appreciate everybody that's that's joined in and asked questions and with the comments. We, we really do appreciate it. Please like and subscribe. Uh, tell your friends. And, Russell, make sure you get Richard Sarabia, black tank top hockey royalty. Make sure you get Oh, yeah. Him. Oh, yeah. It's on the way. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. There. Thank you, guys. And as always, go Kings go. Okay.